Hey, it's Chris. I want to do something a little bit different um, for this lesson of gospel backgrounds. I want to look at the final week of Jesus through a, a more of a bird's eye view or maybe even a satellite eye view. I say satellite because I'm going to be using the satellite Bible Atlas and um, Dr. Slag has got a, a map here that I'll have as a introduction to each event. And then he's got just a you know, short summary of, of what happened there. Um, this will be a probably a little bit longer than I usually. I try to keep videos around a half hour. This one could be close to an hour just because there's a lot going on. In fact, when we do our um, verse by verse harmony over these same passages, it's going to take us 14 or 15 weeks to get through all of this. So a lot going on in that final week. Um, a, a note about the sites. So you'll, you'll see a lot of sites where uh, it's a traditional location or it's a suggested location. Um, I, I think there is value. Of course, we want to strive for the truth, but I think even on these more questionable sites, there is some value for understanding what's going on. And as long as we keep the focus on what happened there and not, not that this was the exact spot of ground that it happened in, um, I think we'll be okay. So I want to keep this moving. So let's move right on to Palm Sunday. So I've already recorded the video on Palm Sunday where we're going to go into these passages in much more detail. But uh, here we're going to uh, condense all of this location into the area of Bethphage, Bethany, and then the Mount of Olives, all leading up to the triumphal entry on, uh, on what we know as Palm Sunday. So to begin Palm Sunday, Jesus starts at the village of Bethany on the Mount of Olives, and you can find this in John chapter 12. This is the same village where only just a few weeks before Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. And this is also where Mary, Lazarus's sister, anointed Jesus' feet with a precious ointment, and then she, she smeared that ointment with her hair. And uh, Judas, uh, may, probably among others, but Judas was the one recorded, protested this gesture, but Jesus defended her, saying she'd done a noble deed. Then next in John chapter 12, uh, John records the triumphal entry from Bethphage, and this is where Jesus uh, secured a donkey and wrote it down and the people were shouting hosannas and waving palm branches and they, they spread their their clothes on the on the ground so that you know kind of a, a royal welcome for the king so the political expectations were thinking that jesus was going to be someone like moses um, someone to redeem them and to throw off the yoke of the roman empire um, even despite this uh, zechariah 9 9 recorded that israel's king would come into jerusalem humbly and, uh, and and he'd have to lay down his life, but they kind of do what we to, we do today. They, they see in Jesus who we want to see in Jesus. We, we kind of create the Jesus we want in our mind. So um, that's exactly what they're doing. So we're, we're no different, and the bottom line is. Um, so when Simon the Maccabee in, um, in about 164 BC uh, threw off the yoke of the Seleucid Empire in, in much a similar way. He was greeted with palm branches and singing and all that. So it was very much fresh in their minds that uh, Jesus was coming as a political king. Here's another picture of uh, Gethsemane. And so Jesus is going to make his way down the road. And, and of course, it's all paved today, but modern pilgrims generally come down here. We spend some time at Dominus Flevit, which is the uh, point that marks where Jesus wept. Who knows if that was the location it happened in or not, but it was it was somewhere around here. That's what we know. And then um, the, the pilgrimage will continue down here, um, meet up with this road here, and then go right in between Gethsemane, and then follow this uh, walkway here and, and enter the city. Then in Luke chapter 19, verses 41 through 44, we read that Jesus stopped Despite all of this coronation, despite all of the singing, uh, he stopped and he wept over the city of Jerusalem. And that tells me he, he loved this city very much and was heartbroken that they were not accepting him as their, uh, as their savior, Messiah. Um, they only wanted him in a political sense. He also uh, gave a prophecy of the destruction of Jerusalem that came true in astonishing detail in 70 AD. In fact, at one point, Jesus says, not one uh, stone will be left upon another. And we might read that as, okay, that means Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. When you can go to a place on the western side of the Temple Mount and see literally not one stone was left upon another. It's, it's a place in Jerusalem where you can actually touch fulfilled prophecy, and it's quite, quite powerful to be there. 
So that's uh, the Dominus Flavit uh, church. And then he goes into the temple. He uh, has some exchanges and then he returns ultimately to Bethany and uh, Mark 11, 11 records that. Next, Mark 11 records that Jesus is in the temple and for the second time he cleansed the temple courts of buyers, sellers, and money changers just like he did in John chapter 2 much earlier. The um, Matthew and Luke note that the religious leaders didn't arrest Jesus since they feared the reaction of the people and th therefore they tried to get into verbal uh, showdowns with him which you, know, you can imagine how well that went. Um, Jesus is a pretty good, uh, pretty good debater. Um, so the fact that they feared the reaction of the people tells me a, a couple of things. The first, the trial was really kept on the down low. I think they didn't want a scene. They were afraid that there was going to be a riot um, had the people known what was going to happen um, that actually happened. And the second thing that tells me is that the crowd on Palm Sunday chanting Hosanna and singing Psalm 118 probably were not the same crowd on Friday chanting crucify him. I, I know it's popular to portray um, the followers on Palm Sunday as fickle and kind of pouty when they didn't get what they wanted. They they turned on him. I just I don't see any evidence of that in scripture. And in fact, there's evidence to the contrary that says, no, Jesus was wildly popular. Um, and it was the deep state or the, the cabal, you know, whatever, whatever you want to call them, that wanted Jesus taken out and they wanted it done pretty quietly. When we get to the trial section, I will have a list of uh, irregularities and outright illegalities about Jesus's trial. Um, things that, you know, it was supposed to be done during the day, it was supposed to be public, and all this was done private at night um, and, 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 and that kind of thing. Okay, then we're going to move to uh, what traditionally is Thursday and the upper room, and Luke 22 records this. So this is a traditional location. You can see the orange arrow there, and uh, it's where Jesus had the Passover celebration, and he, you know, infused further meaning into it by, you know, instituting the uh, this, the the sacrament of communion. And uh, today it's marked by a building that dates from the Crusader period, although there is some historical evidence to think that this, the, the actual upper room was somewhere in the same uh, neighborhood. So the upper room can be hard to find. Um, let me get my laser pointer here. So the traditional location of the upper room is here, and uh, it's sort of by this Dormitian Abbey, and the Dormitian Abbey is a, a rather big building. Um, it's outside, just outside the city walls, and it's it's near the Armenian quarter here. What is cool is uh, you can do a walk along the old city walls, and Sarah and I did that in 2013. And apart from my fear of heights, it was a fantastic experience. You just get great views of the city, and uh, you learn a lot about the different uh, quarters as you go along, too. So this is the traditional room of the Last Supper. These, uh, this type of architecture indicates a crusader period. You can see the, the Arabic here. At uh, one time, this was a mosque. So um, when the, I think I've said in previous videos, Jerusalem changed hands several times um, throughout the centuries. And when uh, the next group comes in, they tend not to like the holy site of the previous group. And so, uh, um, so probably after the the Crusader period ended, and then the second uh, Islamic period started, you know, at one point they converted this into a mosque. But um, it was actually a friendly uh, friendly give back, if you will, more recently that uh, it was given back to the Franciscans and uh, kind of converted back into a Christian holy site. Which it's interesting because that just doesn't happen that often. Usually, when when one site uh, takes over a holy site, they they tend to keep it and not want to give it back. Next is Gethsemane, and it is uh, so he made his way from the Lord's Supper and after dinner and after four glasses of wine, remember the four glasses of wine, that was part of Passover, which ex probably explains why the disciples were a little sleepy. Um, they would have made their way probably, I could have either gone this way or around here through the Kidron Valley, and then back up to Gethsemane, which we saw on the uh, the picture of the Palm Sunday robe. 
So Jesus taught his disciples. He prayed. Uh, he knew the end was coming. Um, then he crossed the Kidron Valley and, and came to Gethsemane. This is all recorded in John 14 through 18. So really the, the whole big chunk of the book of John covers this final night um, of Jesus' life. And it's, it's a very powerful read. And, and the, the high priestly prayer of Jesus is recorded in John 17, and it's very powerful. So uh, he, he goes to Gethsemane, he prays, and then this is where Judas will lead a band of officers from the chief priests, and Jesus will be arrested, and then the disciples uh, will scatter. There are two parts of Gethsemane uh, today. If you remember, they're separated by that street that people walk down on, on the Palm Sunday road. So um, as you're facing Jerusalem to your left is the public area. And so this is the, the garden that's adjacent to the Church of All Nations. And they claim that they're 2,000 year old olive trees. Uh, and, and the tour guides like to tell you this could be the tree that Jesus prayed by. Um, all of the trees are probably very old. We can tell by the tree trunks. Josephus does record that the Romans cleared the Mount of Olives using the wood for, for the siege works during the Jewish revolt. So these, they may be old trees, but they're probably not quite, uh, not quite to the time of Jesus. There is a um, cave that has been now venerated by the church, and it has been suggested that this cave is where the Jesus, Jesus and the disciples may have used this for meeting and sleeping. So it, there's a, a, a note in the Gospels that this was the area was well known to them. So um, basically, this could have been a site where they they you know took cover from the elements and yet it was close enough to Jerusalem for the Passover feasts and all that kind of uh, good stuff. Um, since the Byzantine period, which the Byzantine period is, starts around um, 330, if I'm not mistaken, and continues to the early 600s, which is when the Islamic period starts. They, um, so we, we know this place was venerated back to that time and they believed this commemorated the location of Gethsemane. So across the street from the public area, there is a much more secluded private area. And you can tell that these trees are clearly younger than, uh, than the time of Jesus. You can, you can tell that by the, the thickness of the tree trunks there. Um, it's, it's an amazing place to reflect on what Jesus did for you and for me. Um, it's actually, you have to go here. It's, it's just hard to find the words. So, um, what is interesting is very well managed and it's it's you have to pay a, a fee to, to get in and you can get your your tour group can get time for like half hour or an hour you know depending on um on what the rate is that day and and the availability and what is interesting is that this scene is it, it's very natural they try to keep it natural whereas the the public area it's you can't even get near the olive trees because there's like ropes and and paved sidewalks and or gravel sidewalks and that kind of thing here you can walk right under them you can sit under a huge olive tree and just reflect on on um kind of what happened the night of gethsemane and you know jesus's agony and and what he had to go through for us so what's interesting is that this is like right near a, a an extremely busy street and so there's and israelis are known for uh using their horns <laughs> um so there's always horns honking it's noisy um big trucks engines um you've got church bells going all the time you've got the muslim call to prayer happening periodically blasting from loudspeakers so I, when i was there i couldn't help be reminded that it was this was the world um that jesus came in now obviously it wasn't quite that noisy then but it was people who were busy and really not interested in him that's why he came So Dr. Bolin writes, Judas and the band of soldiers may have approached Gethsemane from the eastern gate of the temple compound, which you can see here. Um, this is the sealed off eastern gate. It was sealed in the 9th century AD. Um, this may have been where the Golden Gate stands today. And this photo shows the proximity of the Golden Gate to Gethsemane. So Kidron Valley is here. And then you just, just start at the, at the base of the uh, Mount of Olives to, um, as you start to ascend, the, the Garden of Gethsemane is right at the foot of the mountain. Okay, next we have the trials at Annas and Caiaphas's house. 
and these are recorded in John 18 and then Matthew 26. What is interesting is we do not have solid archaeological evidence for um, either of these locations. Each house, so Annas's house has two contenders and Caiaphas's house has two contenders. In any case, we know from the, the Bible that Jesus was led bound to Annas, the former high priest and father-in-law of the current high priest, Caiaphas. Annas tried intimidating Jesus with questions about his disciples and teaching. Then, um, then Jesus was brought before a group of scribes and priests. Um, among them was Caiaphas, and there was another trial. Here, Jesus testified that he was the Messiah, son of God, and eventually he would be seen sitting at the right hand of power, um, coming on the clouds of heaven. And so this was just absolute blasphemy to those religious leaders, um, worthy of death. And then what is going on at the same time Jesus is undergoing these trials, Peter is outside in a courtyard and he is uh, denying Jesus three times. So after being arrested in Gethsemane, Jesus would have been led by his captors probably along the eastern bank of the Kidron Valley and then across to um, Annas' house. So here's one potential location. Lean Rittenmeyer has suggested that there is a palatial mansion um, that uh, might be the house of Annas, but there's really that not, not a whole lot remains today uh, that's of any interest to um, anyone but archaeologists. So uh, not, not a whole lot to see there today. And then another potential location is the Covenant of the Olive Tree. Um, that's a very late uh, Armenian tradition, and this happens to be in the Armenian uh, quarter, that uh, says this could have been Anna's house. As far as Caiaphas's house, probably the top contender is St. Peter in Galakantu, although there is an, another Armenian tradition of uh, the house at St. Savior. So this is the Armenian Covenant of the Olive Tree. It's one of the locations of the House of Annas. This is showing that, um, so Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. So this is the, the cloister of the Armenian monastery that is, is their contender for the House of Caiaphas. This is a carving that's at the uh, Catholic Church St. Peter in Galakantu. And that's probably the other potential candidate. And that tradition for that goes back to 334 of the Common Era. There was someone known as the Pilgrim of Bordeaux. We don't really know his name, except we know he's from Bordeaux. Um, he, he wrote of his travels in the Holy Land. And so not that long after, uh, after the, the events happened, there were clearly some sites being venerated by the early Christians. So some excavations here revealed a deep pit in the basement of the house, which I'll, I'll show you on a separate slide, that this could have been a holding cell for Jesus. Um, odd to have a cell in your home, but I guess if you're a corrupt high priest with political enemies, you know, you may, you may need one, I don't know. Um, so this is one of those traditional locations. We may never know whether this is the spot. However, it's, it's an effective memorial to the events that happened there. Um, and it's a vivid reminder that, uh, that our denial is, is just as, we deny Jesus just as often as Peter denies Jesus. Here's a church of St. Peter in Galakantu, and Galakantu means cock crowing. So poor Peter, forever remembered by his worst failure, the three denials of Jesus. There's a carving in, inside this church. Um, I mentioned there's a pit that could have been a prison cell and there was a shaft that they think they might have just dumped prisoners down. It's about you know six or seven feet. Um, so not, not enough to break any legs, not that they cared about that back in those days. Um, so what's interesting is there are Byzantine crosses on three sides of the shaft leading down to the prison. So it, it gives evidence that the site was hallowed by early Christians um, at, at some point. So inside the church, there are these, what could very well be uh, prison cells. And so Dr. Bolin writes, the church includes a rock cut crypt known traditionally as the prison where Jesus stayed the night of his trial. Although he does write this identification is questionable. Parts of a mosaic, early mosaic, were found in 1994, supporting the belief that the place was hallowed by early Christians as the location of the high priest place. So again, a lot of traditional uh, support 
for this to be the place where Jesus was held. But again, even if it wasn't, um, we we remember what happened there, and we don't worship the the ground. You know, um, we, we remember that Jesus died and was uh, you know endured these unfair trials, and then ultimately died for our for our sakes. They've excavated an ancient street, so all all of this is there's just some some good evidence that uh, this might have been the place uh, of Caiaphas' house. A powerful sculpture on the grounds of the church is a statue of Peter denying um, Christ, and it's, you, you look on on his face and you kind of see the inquisitive eyes of, of the servant girl saying, "Are you also one of this man's disciples?" You know, your accent gives you away, and you can you can see him denying and maybe getting more emphatic with each denial. So, very powerful, um, per, pow, powerful sculpture. So, these are some more pictures of the. Church of St. Peter in Galicantu, and so you can see the the weather vane on top of the church is a rooster. So um, again, you know, imagine your biggest failure being public knowledge. Um, that alone is bad enough, but no matter what else you did, you're you're forever identified by that one failure. So um, that's that's Peter's legacy, unfortunately. Now for him, uh, the story doesn't end there. Um, Peter's three denials were erased by three affirmations at a place called Tagpa, which my friend Dan Stolberger calls Restoration Beach. On the grounds of the church, there's a number of plaques and, and sculptures, and, and I loved this one. I took a picture of it. The Lord turned and looked at Peter, and he went out and wept bitterly, and that's in Luke 22. Then the poem starts, Jesus, once filled with sorrow because of Peter's sin, is now gazing at us. He longs that we too might shed tears of repentance over our sins. The more we weep in, in contrition for having grieved Jesus, the more fervent our love for him will be. So if you're looking for application in all this, uh, we're Peter. <laughs> we're the denier. We're the one saying we're never going to deny you. And then we're the very person who denies him. So um, again, there's uh, for all of our failures, there is restoration um, available. Next, we don't have a lot of information about this, but uh, the Luke records that Jesus was brought before the Sanhedrin which probably met in the chamber of hewn stone on the Temple Mount. And so once again, Jesus is testifying that he's the Messiah, the Son of God. Um, this is where Judas uh, felt remorse, um, and he throws the 30 pieces of silver back into the temple, and they say, you know, we can't take it because it's blood money. This is a picture of the uh, model of Jerusalem that is uh, at the Israel Museum, and this is the really cool representation of what they think Jerusalem looked like in the first century. So Luke records here that as soon as it was day, the council of elders of the people convened, both chief priests and scribes. And what commentators have picked up on is neither um, Matthew, Mark, nor Luke mentions anything about Pharisees being involved in any of these trial processes. Um, and when you think about it, that makes sense because above all else, they, uh, they're main goal was to keep the law. They're, they're, they wanted to be righteous according to the law. And so when we look at what some of the requirements for a trial, particularly a capital capital trial, were, um, we, we could easily conclude that they would have had no part of it. And therefore, the conclusion is that uh, they were probably deliberately excluded from the proceedings. And, and really, this was just a sham trial. Uh, Lancaster lists some of these in, in his commentary and I thought it'd be interesting just to kind of walk through a few of these. What's interesting is that any of these irregularities should have resulted at a minimum in a mistrial and in many cases it would have been the charges should have been dropped immediately and Jesus should have been freed. So let's look at some of these. So capital cases had to be heard in front of the complete Sanhedrin on the Temple Mount. So therefore the trials by Annas and Caiaphas were completely illegal. Again, doesn't look like any Pharisees were there. Capital cases had to be tried by daylight. We know the first two trials were um, uh, in in the wee morning hours before it was daylight. Luke here mentions as soon as it was day. John mentions that uh, early in the morning Jesus was brought to Pilate. So who even knows if, if this council was during daylight? Um, but at a minimum, we know the first two were not during daylight. So again, illegal. 
No trials could be held on Sabbaths or holy days, which this was. The Sanhedrin did not even officially convene during the entire month of Nisan, which is when Passover occurs. So the, this March-April time frame is, is where the Hebrew month of Nisan lands, and they just they didn't even meet the whole month. The court should not have declared a guilty verdict the same day as a trial. So they wanted to avoid a rush to judgment. They wanted to avoid a sham trial. Exactly what happened here. Um, and so that, that's why this protection was there. False testimony should have been nullified and the witness should have been punished. We know that, of course, there were false witnesses that were heard. And, you know, as soon as someone gave a story that the, the group wanted to hear, then, then that testimony was allowed. The court was supposed to appoint a defense counsel in capital cases, so no evidence that that ever happened. The accused should not have been allowed to incriminate himself. So in the United States, we have the Fifth Amendment, which offers a similar protection. However, a witness or the accused has to invoke it. What the Jewish law did was take that a step further, and the prosecutors weren't even allowed to ask an incriminating question. So they had to prove their case by anything other than the defendant's own testimony. So obviously that didn't happen here because they asked Jesus directly, um, you know, if they thought he was God and, and, you know, he said, you have said so. And then they, they tore their clothes and, and melted down. In a capital case, the senior judge should have voted last to avoid influencing the court. Uh, it's recorded that Caiaphas voted first. Uh, in a sense, he said, I say, you know, he's guilty. What do you all say? Uh, kind of thing. A unanimous guilty vote should have been declared a mistrial. This, this one I find fascinating. The thought is that um, if you can't convince one of the members of the Sanhedrin, and there were, you know, 70, 72 members, if you can't convince one of them, then the jury, then the defendant did not get a fair trial. So um, that, this is very interesting. And of course, in Jesus's uh, trial, there's no record of anyone dissenting. So these these first nine are in the Talmud. There's a tenth one that uh, pointed out by Chuck Missler, among others. So Pilate, who was the emperor of the world's official representative for the region, declared Jesus innocent. So you know, basically, the ruler of the world at the time, to, you know, his agent declared Jesus innocent. It should have been game over at that point. So again, not clear that any Pharisees participated in these. Um, so despite their dislike for Jesus, uh, among many of them, there were they were so righteous ab above the law. And so therefore, it's just highly unlikely they would have tolerated this affront to the Jewish law. And so not unreasonable to speculate that these trials were held in, uh, in their absence. So, and Lancaster points out Caiaphas probably didn't feel be held in to be holden to these rules since he was not conducting an official trial right if, if you're a criminal you don't care much what the law says um and so the these rules on the screen were safeguarding procedures instituted by pharisees that pertain to a legitimate sanhedrin um so interesting this is clearly was not a legitimate proceeding so we all knew this but i, I think it's it's kind of fascinating to see the uh, the legal background on this so now we have Jesus coming before Pilate. So instead of carrying out the sentence themselves, the religious leaders you know, said, it's not lawful for us to put someone to death, so we need you to put someone to death for us. Um, there are two suggested locations. One is up here by the Temple Mount at the Antonio Fortress. And then the more likely one is at the, um, the Herodian Palace, which is more likely where a, a person of, uh, of government would stay. So this is where, this is where the Roman troops stayed. Um, the, the governor probably doesn't stay with the troops. The governor probably stays in, in the nice posh palace. So this is where Pilate conducts an interview with Jesus and Pilate says, what is truth? And, you know, so you are a king and all that. It's interesting that Jesus declares, uh, Pilate declares Jesus innocent. He washes his hands of the whole thing. Um, but when Pilate learned that Jesus was a Galilean, that's when he, you know, he, he tried to pass the buck by sending him to uh, Herod Antipas. Um, who was, would have been in Jerusalem for the Passover festival. This is in the uh, Jerusalem model where uh, the Antonio Fortress would have been. If you remember our study on the pools of Bethesda, that, those are them right there. Um, so 
the soldiers kept an eye on they kept a watchful eye on anything going on um on the temple and we're really watching for riots and insurrections and that kind of thing the antonio fortress was built by herod and named in honor of someone famous in roman lore that i'm sure you've heard of named mark antony and so again the they it was a soldier area to watch over the activities on the Temple Mountain and make sure people were behaving themselves and that kind of thing. Most scholars though believe that Pilate would have been residing down here at Herod's palace. And this is in today, it's called the Citadel of David. And although it's really got no connection to David whatsoever, but it's it's a place that has been built over and built over and built over so that if you go there today it's, it's really hard to see any um any examples of, of a herodian palace although um, archaeologists insist that they're there so this is where there's a public square area here um uh, it's, it's very conceivable that this could have been the place where jesus was tried so a picture of the um, site today uh, again, this is the Citadel. This is the Jaffa Gate down here. Here's the opening. I talked about um, Kaiser Wilhelm II had, had part of the wall knocked out so he could enter with his uh, um, his entourage. And so that's that's what that is. Uh, and so all of this is, is there's archaeological um, excavations going on all the time. And there's all kinds of different there's Byzantine period things. There's Crusader period things. So it's 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 quite a neat place. So next, thinking that there might be some kind of jurisdiction issue, Pilate sends Jesus to Herod Antipas. And it just says, uh, we, we don't exactly know where his house is. There's been no, no real suggestion. Possibly it was near the Citadel Fortress, although Bolin, uh, Dr. Bolin thinks that that is unlikely. So Antipas asks Jesus many questions. He wants to see some miracle, and Jesus remains silent through the whole thing. So Antipas just Antipas gets frustrated and uh, mockingly dresses Jesus in a purple robe and then sends him back to Pilate. So now Jesus is back before Pilate at the same two, uh, one of the two locations, if, if not a, a third undisclosed that we don't know about. Um, so Pilate suggests a prisoner release gesture. Pilate has Jesus flogged to try and get him released and, and the crowd there is not gonna have any part of it. Um, it is interesting that, as I said before, the crowd there that day, this is this is probably six in the morning. So observant Jews are either sleeping or at home, you know, observing the feast, because this is the first day of the feast. And so my suspicion is that they didn't have any idea any idea this was going on. Um, all of this went down during the night. Um, they this was done intentionally in secret to avoid con conflict with Jesus supporters. So um, I don't, I just don't see it being the same group that was there on Palm Sunday. It could be, I could be wrong, but I, I just don't see it. So this is probably, you know, if I could use the term community organizing, <laughs> um, you need to call in some, a, a crowd of thugs to arrange a protest. And of course we see none of that going on today. And that's all I'll say about that. Um, but anyway, this is probably around six in the morning. Um, then Pilate, Jesus, Pilate turns Jesus over to be crucified. So if you remember, the Gospel of John has the um, the priests bringing Jesus to Pilate early in the morning, it's what it says. And then uh, they won't go inside his compound because they are they, they don't want to defy themselves for the, the Passover feast. So kind of interesting. Uh, they're doing this totally illegal trial, and, and yet they're concerned about ceremony. So anyway, um, so the they say that Pilate comes out to... Um, this the stone pavement and so you can see circled in the foreground here of, of where that proposed location is so despite having we presume Pilate has some doubts about this whole charade that's going on but the the temple establishment the elite the cabal the deep state whatever you want to call them they, they back him into a corner and ultimately accuse him of treason if he lets uh, let's Jesus go. They say you're no friend of Caesar's, which which is you know you're not loyal to Caesar, which is not good for a Roman procurator to have that reputation. So um, he ultimately, as as history records, he fails to do the right thing, despite a warning reportedly from his wife, even to have nothing to do with that innocent man. Um, he washes his hands of it, 
but um, he ultimately, Pilate had the power to free Jesus and, and did not. So he hands him over to the Roman soldiers who beat him some more and, and mock him. And if you've seen The Passion of the Christ, um, that is a fantastic representation of, of the cruelty that he suffered. And again, he's, he suffered this willingly for, for you and me. It's, it's a bit hard to comprehend because why would anyone do that? Um, but uh, but Jesus did, and that's our, that's our Lord. So then he's led to the cross, which is called Golgotha which is now uh, we follow the traditional following is the, the Via Dolorosa is this orange line here. Via Dolorosa is Latin for the way of the cross. And it's kind of cool because along the way there are what's called stations of the cross. Most of these are based on biblical events, maybe a few of them out of order, maybe a few embellished. There are a few just straight up uh, events from tradition that, that are not in the Bible. There's one station where Veronica wipes the face of Jesus, and you know we don't see that anywhere in the Bible. But um, what I guess what our, our issue is today is the authenticity of the, the route is in question, right? So if, if you believe the that Pilate's home was the Antonio Fortress, then then you would start the Via Dolorosa for the Antonio Fortress. However, most historians believe that the uh, Herodian Palace down here was was Pilate's residence, in which case the Via Dolorosa would have taken an entirely different um, different route in in reality because he would have gone you know north here to um, to what is today the Holy Sepulcher. So, but anyway, despite these uh, you know geographic and, and historical inaccuracies and the non-biblical stations, I think there's still devotional value in um, retracing at least some of the stations, maybe not all of them. So um, by necessity, I have to point out historical errors. I just, just I want to be true to you know the evidence. But uh, for this section, I'm going to go through each of the stations just real quickly and encourage you to focus more on the events um, from a devotional perspective rather than you know where they occurred. So focus on what occurred, not so much where it occurred for this this next part. So every Friday at three, there's a Franciscan procession that visits the 14 stations of the cross. So it starts with Jesus is, con so station one is Jesus being condemned to death at, at, here we are at the Fortress Antonia, which you know we believe it happened somewhere else, but for the traditional part of the Via, Dol Via Dolorosa path, it starts at the Antonia Fortress. This is what's called the Ecce Homo Arch, and there is a point where um, Pilate brings out Jesus after he's scourged, and he says, Behold the man, and Ecce Homo is Behold the man in Latin. Um, again, <laughs> just pointing out a, a historical inaccuracy, this arch was actually dated to Hadrian, which is about 100 years after after Jesus. So it's later than the New Testament tradition in which it's associated. So we have an anachronistic error here, but this still the name stuck and it's called the Ecce Homo Arch. Each of the stations, it's hard to see on this one, but there is a uh, there's a Roman numeral uh, marking each station and it'll, it'll, so there's a two, so this is the second station. No idea why the, uh, the rugs are hanging up there. But um, anyway, station two is the Chapel of Condemnation. And that is where Jesus was given the cross to carry. Inside this area, there are there's a Sisters of Zion um, church, and you can go down below, and and they the tradition holds that this is the actual stone pavement um, where Jesus would have been flogged and uh, and beaten and that kind of thing. What is fascinating is they have found this uh, etched stone here. And they presume it was made by Roman soldiers, and actually archaeologists date it to the second century. But um, it, it it could be uh, you know something that was in in play even before then at the time of Jesus. So scholars believe that the, the Roman soldiers toyed and mocked their prisoners through what is called a king's game. It may have been a dice game or something along that line. But they you know they the condemned prisoner who's on his way to die. 
um, you know, hey, you're king, aren't you? So you see some of that in um, in the the gospels. They mock Jesus with a crown of thorns. They cast lots for Jesus' garments and that kind of thing. So it was just this game. The other thing that's interesting is a lot of these they call them secondary stones or secondary use. So this stone could have come from somewhere else in the city that was torn down and then ended up here. Doesn't necessarily mean the events um, took place at this location. Scripture doesn't directly record Jesus falling. There are three stations that commemorate Jesus falling um, that are tied to tradition. However, um, and, and by the way, if you've seen Passion of the Christ, it's the the movie is uh, Mel Gibson and both Jim, both Mel and Jim Caviezel are Catholic, so they would follow the, um, the all 14 stations, including the um, the traditional ones. Um, so it's not to me, it's not inconceivable that w with his likely you know failing medical condition and the weight of the cross and his back was you know severely ripped open well it's not conceivable to me that he probably fell and that could be what led uh, them to make simon of cyrene carry his cross and we'll see that in the next station station four uh is is one of those that wasn't added until like the late 19th century and it, it commemorates a, a non-biblical account of jesus meeting his mother um which again was in the passion of the christ but is uh is not you know it's not in the bible so station five here is the uh it commemorates where simon of cyrene picked up the cross and carried it for jesus the stone on the right is a very late tradition that says jesus rested his hand on that stone and it's now venerated stations six and seven are not in the bible station six has veronica wiping jesus face and station seven has Jesus falling a second time. What's kind of curious about that is they depict Jesus falling under the weight of his cross at the station, even though the very uh, station five is where Simon of Cyrene picked up the cross for him. But anyway, uh, we'll leave that, be that as it may. Um, station eight is in the Bible. It's in Luke, and it commemorates the location where Jesus turned to the women around him and says, said, daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. So this is a very meaningful spot, and it's, it's a good place to stop and read the passage in Luke. Station 9 is where uh, Jesus has Jesus falling for the third time. Station 10 is we're now at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And this station remembers uh, John 19, verse 23, where Jesus was now stripped of his garments. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to each shoulder apart and also the tunic. Now the tunic was without seam, woven from the top in one piece. And there's a lot of symbolism there. All right, let's talk a bit about the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Um, it long has been considered the holiest place in all of Christianity, even, even above the Vatican. Um, because of it is the probable location of the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. There is another contender called the Garden Tomb, and it also goes by the name of Gordon's Calvary. This is really kind of a Johnny-come-lately, and it's sort of Protestants wanted to get in the game and have their own holy site, <laughs> if you ask my opinion. Um, and it, it dates really only from the 1880s. And so I'll have some more slides on the garden tomb. It's not without merit. I think it's got its use, but um, the the Holy Sepulchre is is the place. I'm I'm convinced, uh, in my opinion. Um, kind of one of the reasons there's a competitor is by the standards of most American Protestants and really probably a lot of other faith traditions as well. Going inside there is is not going inside the Holy Sepulchre is not a fun experience. Um, it's gaudy, dingy, it's dark, it's creepy, it, it just kind of smacks of idolatry. Um, kind of everything that's wrong with organized religion is, is wrong with, with this place in here. Um, it is owned by six different religious orders um, and none of them get along. They all, they're all suspicious of each other, they all hate each other. Um, the, this, the symbol of all this is, is this ladder that's been here since uh, I think the, the mid 1700s is when someone first noticed it. And the, the site is so contested that if anyone tries to move that ladder, there'll, there'll be fights breaking out. So the ladder has 
just stayed there and no one's moved it. <laughs> and you can actually uh, look it up on Wikipedia. It's, it's called the, the Im immovable ladder or the status quo ladder. It goes by kind of those names. And that's just sort of symbolic of, of the infighting. Uh, I, I think um, about a decade ago or maybe 15 years ago, you know, someone moved a chair because the chair was in the sun and the guy didn't want to sit in the sun and he moved the chair. And then next thing you know, the Jerusalem police have to show up because there's a brawl breaking out inside the place. So um, it's, you know, it, it's got all that kind of going against it. But what it's got going for it is history. Um, in one in the one thirties, we've talked about this in the Bethlehem video. Hadrian, who is the Roman emperor, wanted to stamp out all things Jewish and all things Jewish Christian and Christian. So he had the original site raised to the ground, R-A-Z-E-D, and he put a temple to Venus in its place. So what this did was exactly the opposite of what he wanted it to do, is that it marked it for future generations. So that in 325, when excavations were done, um, Eusebius, who is an early church historian, confirmed that the tomb was right where it, it, people remembered it to be. It was right there. It was marked. So um, way back, even before um, Helena and Constantine, who, who Constantine was the first builder of the Church of the Holy Sepulcher. So even before then, uh, you know, less than 100 years after the event, it, people remembered this as um, as the location. So there's really very little doubt that this is the place, even though people want to hang on to the garden tomb because it's uh, you'll see the pictures. It's beautiful. It's pristine. It's there's a great worship environment. Um, a lot of times people will say, well, it just, it just feels like the right place. Well, you know, the, you know, the line facts don't care about your feelings. So, uh, <laughs> um, the Holy Supper is the place and, and we go there because it's, we, we mark the location, but we don't subscribe to, you know, kind of what goes on inside there. Um, so later, um, so the Byzantine period would have been the time of Constantine. Then after that, uh, I mentioned Jerusalem has changed hands several times and uh, usually the, the incoming regime doesn't like the religious sites of the outgoing regime. So in AD uh, 614, the church was destroyed by the Persians and then um, you know built years later. And then the next period is uh, the Muslims come in. Um, and um, then there was a caliph that ordered the tomb hacked down to the bedrock because you know he was he was furious with Christians and actually that is the event and this was in um, 1009 is when that happened and uh, that actually triggered the Crusades I mean that was that was the the catalyst that triggered the Crusades to go march from Europe into the the Middle East into Jerusalem and reclaim the holy sites from from Muslim infidels kind of thing um, and they you know raped and pillaged everything in their path uh, in exact opposite of, of what you know Christian behavior should be um, and so it was then rebuilt by the Crusaders and actually most of the church that we see today is is from the Crusader period it's been damaged by fire um, it's been um, you know kind of remodeled and added on to so you can kind of see this going on there might have been a larger courtyard at one time but you can just see there's building upon building it's kind of kind of that part is kind of interesting so really since the crusades christians have been allowed to pray here even though um in, in, in the 1200s is when the second muslim period took in and then we had the ottomans in the the 15th 16th century time frame and uh but since the crusades uh Muslims have had to hold the keys to the church so uh, because of the fact that people don't get along. So today, to this day, a very long tradition of uh, two Muslim families hold the keys and they open and close the door each day. And, and that part, I think, is kind of neat. Uh, it's kind of shows that face, our, our different face can get along, at least for this one time. So back to our stations. This is station 11. Um, this remembers the agonizing moments as Jesus was nailed to the cross. Um, John 19, 17 and 18, and he bearing his cross went out to the place called the place of the skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side and Jesus in the center. So the problem that um, we have today is we, we look at this and we don't see anything that resembles anything like a, you know, a hillside or a, a, 
the garden or anything like that. Um, but that's because of the, you know, it's been torn down and rebuilt and torn down and rebuilt. And, and now there's, you know, a, a church building on top of it. But history shows this is this is the likely location. Station 12 is Jesus crucified. And there is a there's a rocky uh, um, outcropping and, you know, people get on their knees and, and they can can touch that rock today. Station 13 remembers where Jesus' body was taken down from the cross and anointed. And then the final station, station 14, is where Jesus' body was buried. And so it commemorates the location of placing Jesus' body in the tomb. Um, remember, this was the new cave of Joseph Arimathea. Uh, we can read about this in John 19, 41-42. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, in the, in the garden a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was there, the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. One of the um, evidences, pieces of evidence that uh, indicates this is the, the place, is that there are other first century tombs that are still preserved. This is called the Tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. And of course, you know, who knows if it was actually him, but uh, these burial shafts clearly date from the time of Christ's death and they attest to some first century burial ground. The problem with the garden tomb that we'll, we'll show you is that those tombs are more uh, like the kings of Israel days. Um, so they're, they're very old and you, you can't say that it was the first, Jesus was the first person inside the tomb. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about um, Gordon's Calvary. I do think it is worth mentioning. So it's about a mile away, and it, it uh, you can see the picture on the upper left. It just stands in stark contrast to the uh, the dark, gaudy, creepy uh, Church of the Holy Sepulchre because this is lovely, uh, bright, open-air garden. Um, the garden happens to have what appears to be a Rolling Stone tomb. Um, which has led many people to begin to venerate this garden tomb location as the actual location. And uh, this is mostly a Protestant thing. Um, Protestants don't don't like going inside the Holy Sepulchre because they think it's idolatrous and you know dingy, dingy and creepy and all that stuff. So this is you know very nice, very pleasant. Um, it appears to meet the requirements of Jesus' crucifixion. It, it was outside the city. It was near a garden. It was at the place of the skull. I'll show you a picture of that uh, later. The white people think think that, and you know, it appears it appears to be a tomb cut out of rock. It was actually first suggested to be the location in 1842, and then um, in the late 1800s, Charles Warren and um, Charles Gordon, they were generals in the British, um, kind of the British Army age and the Palestine expedition, they they had found these tombs and that had some remains in it. And so uh, G Gordon in particular looked at a map and he had a book of Leviticus out and says, oh, this has to be the place. So and kind of from there, the tradition was born. So why people think it uh, could be the place of the skull, if you look at this rocky cropping here, you can see two eyes, you know, a hollowed out nose. And so that led people to think that, uh, hey, there's the shape of a skull and, uh, you know, this, this must be the place, right? Um, the thing is, in the last hundred years, the, there's been so much erosion that the skull is getting harder and harder to discern. So that tells me that if there's that much this there's that much erosion in the last hundred years, I find it really unlikely that this this could have resembled the skull two thousand years ago. But um, and that's unscientific. That's just my opinion. So Dr. Bolin writes the authenticity of this tomb hangs upon its date. According to Matthew twenty seven uh, and John nineteen, Jesus had to be buried in a new tomb. The problem with this tomb is that this tomb has clearly been altered 
um, and Gabriel Barquet, who's a respected archaeologist, who's got a number of significant finds around Jerusalem, says uh, this tomb dates to the Iron Age, about 700 years earlier, and no archaeologists have uh, published any challenge to this dating. So we got a problem with um, this tomb is just too old to be the, the tomb of Jesus. I'm going to draw this to a close by just giving you some thoughts on the garden tomb. Even though it's not historically accurate and, you know, I'm 99.9999% sure that this is not the place <laughs> of Jesus' burial and resurrection. It just couldn't be. Um, there is, this is a fantastic place to worship. It is a fantastic place to recognize what our Savior did for us. And, um, and I think we join with Christians of all, of all faiths who come here to pray and whatever language that the that is their native tongue and and yet the father hears um hears the prayers you know all as as if you know they're all being spoken in unison so um again that's me on the guitar leading our small group in uh, 2013 and it was just it's just a fantastic experience so um it's a great place to be reminded that without the resurrection we have nothing and that is what Easter is all about, too. That's why we're so I'm trying to do this, <laughs> get it done before uh, Easter so we can reflect on this um, this truth that we can and should recognize anytime, anywhere, in any place. But there is something special about a dedicated place in God's holy city of Jerusalem where we can join with our other believers all around the world to worship our risen Lord. So in my view, a trip to Israel draws travelers closer to Jesus and it's easy to go there and, and miss that because it's just so cool there's so many neat sites there's so many things to do um, but that's what the enemy wants the enemy wants us to divide and the enemy wants us to argue over this place versus that place when in truth we all need to focus on Jesus um, all the more we need to remember that the um, the enemy is the father of lies I'll say to its credit, the, the people that run this place, it's the Garden Tomb Association, and it's affiliated with the Church of England. They don't actually assert that this is the tomb of Jesus, so that's to their credit. They will tell visitors that it doesn't matter whether the tomb is here, and they'll point to the Garden Tomb, or over there, and they'll point to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. What matters is that the tomb, wherever it is, is empty. So as long as we recognize the Garden Tomb for the amazing place that it is, um, and it's one that points to and draws people closer to Jesus and the power of resurrection. Um, and we do not try to make it into something it's not. It's not a plot of ground to be worshipped for its own sake, and it's not something to argue about. Um, I love going there, and uh, I hope that we can all go there sometime soon. So um, have a blessed Easter. The Lord is risen, and we all say together, he is risen indeed. And I will see you on the next video.